Hello, I'm Katie Shahade, an infectious diseases pharmacist at Denver Health Medical Center. I will be reviewing ivermectin as it relates to COVID-19. I have no conflicts of interest. The original presentation was posted in October of 2020. This version is up to date as of March 22nd, 2021. If you watched the original presentation and are just interested in the updates, feel free to jump to slide 29. When most of us hear ivermectin, we probably think antiparasitic. Typical dosing for this indication is 200 micrograms per kilogram, either as a single dose or repeated for several doses, depending on the indication. Ivermectin is fairly clean with regards to drug-drug interactions. As with most antimicrobials, it can increase the anticoagulant effect of warfarin. It is also recommended to not co-administer with live vaccines. Food, especially high-fat foods, can increase the bioavailability, so it's actually recommended to take on an empty stomach for most indications. It does undergo hepatic metabolism, predominantly via CYP3A4. It does not require any dose adjustments for renal or hepatic dysfunction. Understanding the pharmacokinetics of ivermectin is really important as it relates to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which we will get to in a bit. This pharmacokinetic dose escalation study was performed in healthy adults. In this study, healthy adults received standard doses as well as doses up to 10 times the standard dose. The authors found an average peak of 50 nanograms per milliliter after a standard dose and a peak of 250 nanograms per milliliter with doses of 2,000 micrograms per kilogram. They also found that increases in peak and area under the curve are proportional and predictable as seen in the chart. The authors noted the average AUC does not appear to increase between doses of 60 and 90 milligrams, largely due to the influence of the two outliers in the 60 milligram dose group. Ivermectin has also been found to have broad spectrum antiviral activity against animal and human viruses, including both RNA and DNA viruses. Several RNA viruses, including the SARS-CoV-2 virus, depend on important alpha, beta during the process of infection. The proposed anti-SARS-CoV-2 action involves binding of ivermectin to the important alpha, beta-1 heterodimer, leading to its destabilization and prevention of binding to viral proteins. This prevents viral proteins from entering the nucleus, thereby reducing infection and leading to an efficient antiviral response. Ivermectin has in vitro activity against these RNA viruses listed, as well as several DNA viruses. In vivo, however, ivermectin has only been studied for a few of these viruses, and it has had mixed results. Callie and colleagues found that the addition of 5 micromoles of ivermectin to vero cells two hours post-infection with SARS-CoV-2 resulted in a reduction in viral RNA by 99.98% at 48 hours. This is shown in the graph on the left. This is roughly a 5,000-fold reduction in viral load. The IC50, or the concentration at which viral load is reduced by 50%, was determined to be about 2.5 micromoles under these conditions. The authors concluded that the current report, combined with a known safety profile, demonstrates that ivermectin is worthy of further consideration as a possible SARS-CoV-2 antiviral. They stated that ivermectin warrants further investigation. This trial by Callie et al. was published on April 3rd and is what set off an ivermectin frenzy. Just three days later, a preprint was released. This study described in the preprint suggested a mortality benefit when ivermectin was used in critically ill patients with COVID-19. These two papers excited widespread interest on medical and veterinary websites, which often incorrectly describe the drug as a treatment or cure for COVID-19. These inappropriate statements led to a warning by the FDA that ivermectin in veterinary products should not be used for human therapy, as this unfortunately was happening in parts of the world. On April 19th, that preprint was retracted as the data was found to be flawed, although it was replaced with a new preprint. This new study by the same authors had a very different study design, but still showed a mortality benefit. Well, the second preprint was also retracted as the data was still found to be flawed. Despite the single in vitro study and flawed preprinted articles, ivermectin made its way to the National Therapeutic Guidelines for COVID-19 of Peru on May 8th. 
It led to mass drug administration of ivermectin to hundreds of thousands of people for treatment or prevention of COVID-19 in Bolivia, where it was added to treatment guidelines about a week after Peru. By early June, at least one municipality in Brazil had endorsed the use of ivermectin as a preventative medicine for COVID-19. Some government officials in Central and South America were touting ivermectin while medical experts were sounding alarm bells. Countries, most of which had ivermectin available as over-the-counter, were running out of supply. Paraguay restricted the ivermectin market and advocacy groups in Colombia were calling for a national ivermectin policy. Some doctors in countries that ran out of ivermectin started administering ivermectin formulated for animals. This single in vitro study by Callie et al. is just part of the picture. Understanding the pharmacokinetics and penetration of ivermectin to the site of infection is important in transferring in vitro knowledge to potential in vivo utilization. Therefore, the objective of this study was to develop a minimal physiologically based pharmacokinetic model to simulate human lung exposure of ivermectin after oral administration. Plasma and lung ivermectin concentration versus time profiles in cattle were used to determine the apparent plasma to lung tissue partition coefficient of ivermectin. This data, along with data from published PK studies in humans, were used to develop their model, which they found accurately described the simulated ivermectin plasma concentration profile in humans. The model was used to simulate human lung exposure to ivermectin after 12, 30, and 120 milligram oral doses. Figure A shows lung exposure following a 120 milligram dose. Keeping in mind, this is about 10 times a normal ivermectin dose. And you can see the peak concentration is far below the IC50 for SARS-CoV-2. Another modeling study was conducted to determine what ivermectin doses would potentially result in lung concentrations reaching the IC50. A population PK model was used to simulate plasma concentration time profiles for several dosing regimens. 500 simulations were performed and yielded the results seen in the graphs. For all dosing regimens, ivermectin plasma concentrations did not come close to reaching the IC50 reported by Callie and colleagues, even for doses 10 times higher than the approved dose or after repeat doses. Plasma exposures did not increase substantially after repeat dosing, with very limited ivermectin accumulation after three times weekly or weekly dosing. To summarize the ivermectin exposure issue, this table shows several PK studies of ivermectin in humans in varying doses. The inhibitory concentration determined by Cali et al. is 72 times the Cmax of a standard ivermectin dose and 9 times that of the highest dose ever studied in humans. Despite it being highly unlikely that adequate ivermectin concentrations could be achieved in vivo, many studies now have been conducted, most of which have not yet been published as they have not gone through the peer review process. This first is the ICON trial. It's a retrospective cohort study of hospitalized patients with confirmed SARS-CoV-2 in four hospitals in Florida. They included 280 patients, 173 received ivermectin in addition to usual care, and 107 received usual care. Usual care included hydroxychloroquine plus or minus azithromycin. As for baseline characteristics, the average age was around 60, most patients were male, and about half the patients were black. About a quarter of the patients had severe disease. The most notable difference between groups is that more patients in the ivermectin group received corticosteroids, whereas a higher proportion of patients in the usual care group received hydroxychloroquine or hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin. They used propensity score matching to try and reduce the effects of confounders. In their matched cohort, they included 98 patients in each group, and they appeared to be well matched. The primary outcome was all-cause mortality. Secondary outcomes were mortality stratified by severity of disease, successful extubation rates, and hospital length of stay. All outcomes significantly favored ivermectin, except for length of stay. There was also no difference for successful extubation in the matched cohort. Multivariate analysis was performed on the unmatched cohort. Independent predictors of hospital mortality included treatment group, age, and severe disease. This study is one of the largest ivermectin studies and is certainly intriguing, but has a number of limitations. Most concerning is the retrospective nature of the study design 
and that more patients in the ivermectin group received corticosteroids. This is a major limitation given randomized controlled trials have found a mortality benefit with corticosteroids. Another limitation is that almost all patients received hydroxychloroquine, many of which also received azithromycin. Another limitation is that more patients in the control group were enrolled earlier in the trial, subjecting the study to timing bias. As we learned more about this disease early on, we got better at caring for these patients. They used propensity score matching as well as multivariate analysis to attempt to adjust for these confounders, however biases could still have skewed the results. The authors concluded that further studies in appropriately designed randomized trials are recommended before any conclusions can be made. This next study looks at the effectiveness of ivermectin as add-on therapy. It is a pilot, interventional, single-center study with a synthetic control arm. A synthetic control arm is an external control constructed from patient-level data from previous patients to match the baseline characteristics of the patients in the investigational group. In this study, the synthetic control arm included previous patients who were treated with hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, according to the Iraqi Ministry of Health protocols for the treatment of COVID-19. Patients were included if they were at least 18 years old and hospitalized with mild to moderate COVID-19. Patients received ivermectin as a single dose in addition to five days of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. There were 16 patients in the ivermectin add-on arm, which were compared to 71 historic controls. The baseline characteristics were well matched. The primary outcome was percentage of cured patients within 23 days. Cure was defined as the proportion of patients who were symptom-free and had two consecutive negative PCR results at least 24 hours apart. There was no difference in cure or mortality between groups. They did find a statistically shorter length of stay when ivermectin was added. The authors noted that no obvious adverse events were reported, and they concluded that when added to hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, ivermectin contributed to a shorter length of stay, but that larger prospective studies are needed to validate these data. Important to note that this has not been peer-reviewed. So moving on to the first randomized controlled trial, this was an open-label RCT. They included adult outpatients with mild to moderate COVID-19 and notably excluded patients taking hydroxychloroquine or who had symptoms for more than seven days. Patients were randomized to receive a single dose of ivermectin plus standard of care versus standard of care alone. Over 1,600 patients were tested for SARS-CoV-2 with 416 who tested positive. After excluding the majority of patients, 82 were randomized and ultimately 62 were available for analysis. There were 30 patients who received standard of care alone and 32 who also received ivermectin. The majority of patients were male with mild disease. Most common signs and symptoms were fever and cough. The primary outcome was time needed for resolution of all symptoms, which is shown in the graph. The authors found no difference in time to resolution of symptoms for patients who received ivermectin compared to those who did not. The authors also evaluated the result of repeat PCR on the 10th day for 20 patients in each arm. They found no difference in the proportion of patients who still tested positive on day 10. The authors concluded that ivermectin had no benefit on disease course in mild to moderate cases. The next study is another randomized controlled trial in outpatients. The purpose of this study was to compare ivermectin plus doxycycline with hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin. All outpatients with a positive SARS-CoV-2 test were included whether they had symptoms or not. Most patients with any comorbid conditions were excluded. Patients were also excluded if their room air oxygen saturation was less than 95% or if they had an abnormal chest x-ray. So they were after relatively healthy adults with mild disease. 181 patients were assessed for eligibility, and after excluding patients who did not meet inclusion criteria or who declined to participate, there were 60 patients in the ivermectin-doxycycline group and 56 in the hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin group. Most patients in this study were male, with an average age of about 35 years old. The majority of patients were symptomatic, but about a quarter of patients in each group were asymptomatic. All patients underwent repeat PCR testing every other day until their PCR was negative. The average time to negative PCR was about nine days in both groups. 
Time to symptom recovery was 5.9 days in the ivermectin doxy group and 7 days in the hydroxychloroquine azithromycin group. Adverse effects were reported more often by the hydroxychloroquine azithromycin group, but the specific adverse effects reported were similar between groups and included lethargy, dizziness, blurred vision. They just happened more often with hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. The authors concluded that although there are no statistically significant findings, there's a possible trend towards advantage with ivermectin and doxycycline, and that a larger scale trial is needed. So now I will review some of the new literature that has been released since the original presentation. This table summarizes the observational studies. The first study was a case series out of India. The authors included 148 hospitalized patients with COVID-19 of any severity. Most patients had mild disease, and all patients were treated according to India's standard of care at the time, which was a single dose of ivermectin, unclear what the actual dose was, plus atorvastatin plus an acetylcysteine. Primary outcomes were mortality and discharge. They found a mortality rate of 1.4%, and the authors stated that the other 144 patients discharged after an average of 12 days, which is quite long given the vast majority of these cases were mild, uh, there are also two patients who are unaccounted for. The study by Carvalho and colleagues was a prospective observational study out of Argentina. It included inpatients and outpatients, and the vast majority of which had mild disease. All patients received either 24 or 48 milligrams of ivermectin, plus dexamethasone, plus either anoxaparin or aspirin, depending on disease severity. Their primary outcomes were the percentage of patients that had disease progression and mortality. They found a mortality rate of 0.6% and none of the mild cases progressed. The next study by Morgan Stern and colleagues was a retrospective observational study of inpatients and outpatients in the Dominican Republic. Outpatients received ivermectin at a dose of 400 micrograms per kilogram times one dose plus azithromycin. Inpatients received ivermectin at 300 micrograms per kilogram on days 1, 2, 6, and 7, in addition to azithromycin and dexamethasone. Critically ill patients also may have received tocilizumab or methotrexate. Their primary outcomes were mortality and disease progression. For their results, 0.59% of outpatients progressed to require hospitalization, and for inpatients, they found a mortality rate of 9%, and amongst those who were critically ill, a mortality rate of 30%. These findings are all in line with observational studies that did not involve ivermectin. The last study is by Alam and colleagues out of Bangladesh. They published a case series of patients with mild, moderate, or severe disease. All patients received a single dose of ivermectin as 200 micrograms per kilogram plus 10 days of doxycycline. Their outcomes were symptomatic improvement and follow-up PCR results. They found that about half their patients with mild to moderate disease had symptomatic improvement between days three and five, and those with severe disease had symptomatic improvement by day seven. There were no ICU admissions or deaths in the study. They retested patients anywhere between day four and 18 and found all repeat PCRs to be negative. To summarize some of the limitations within these studies, they are all observational without a comparator group, so low quality evidence. Many of the outcomes reported are similar to other observational studies that did not use ivermectin. So the bottom line here is that nothing can really be drawn from these studies. Moving up slightly in the quality of evidence are these studies listed here, which include non-randomized comparator studies. The study by Spurthi and colleagues was conducted in India and published in the International Archives of Integrated Medicine. It's a prospective placebo-controlled trial conducted in hospitalized patients with mild to moderate COVID-19. 50 patients received a single dose of ivermectin plus seven days of doxycycline, compared to 50 patients who received placebo. They listed their primary outcome as to establish efficacy of ivermectin plus doxycycline. They found that ivermectin with doxycycline led to shorter hospital stay and faster time to resolution of symptoms. The study by Camprubia and colleagues was a retrospective cohort study of hospitalized patients with severe disease in Spain.
13 patients received a single dose of ivermectin and 13 did not. Everyone got hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. Some in either group also received tocilizumab, steroids, anakinra, a combination of these, or potentially all of these. Almost everyone also received lopinavir and ritonavir. The primary outcome was stated as clinical and microbiological outcomes. They found no difference between groups for any of their outcomes. The study by Behera and colleagues was a matched case control study of healthcare workers in India assessing ivermectin as prophylaxis. They matched 186 cases to 186 controls. Matching was based on profession, gender, age, and also an attempt to match for the date of diagnosis. 115 participants reported a history of ivermectin use for prophylaxis, 77 in the control group and 38 in the case group. In the control group, there was more prophylactic vitamin C and hydroxychloroquine consumed, for which is a confounding factor. It's also a bit unclear how they got their cases and controls. The primary outcome was diagnosis of COVID-19. They found that ivermectin prophylaxis was associated with a lower risk of infection. The next observational study is another one by Alam and colleagues out of Bangladesh. They included healthcare workers and evaluated ivermectin as pre-exposure prophylaxis. 58 healthcare workers received ivermectin at 12 milligrams every four weeks for four months, and they were compared to 60 healthcare workers who did not receive prophylaxis. Their primary outcome was to determine the effectiveness of ivermectin when administered as pre-exposure prophylaxis for COVID-19. They found that ivermectin decreased the risk of COVID-19 infection. The last study by Gomez, Hernandez, and colleagues was from a single center in Bangladesh. It was a retrospective cohort study of hospitalized patients with mild to moderate disease. 115 patients received ivermectin plus standard of care versus 133 who received standard of care alone. Standard of care was antipyretics, antihistamines, antibacterials as needed. More patients received antibiotics and required oxygen in the standard of care group. The primary outcomes were time to PCR negativity, disease progression, duration of hospital stay, and mortality. The authors found shorter time to negative PCR and shorter hospital stay in the ivermectin group. They also found lower mortality in the ivermectin group. To summarize these trials, again, low quality evidence and that these are not randomized trials, so they are subject to selection bias. In most of these trials, patients received additional therapies and it was not well described as to who received what exactly. The methods for several of the trials were not well described and without sound methodology, the results simply can't be trusted. Also, the number of patients in these trials are small. I say these studies could be considered hypothesis generating at best. This table includes the open label randomized controlled trials. The first is from Argentina. They studied hospitalized patients with mild to moderate COVID-19. There were 30 patients who received ivermectin at a dose of 600 micrograms per kilogram once a day for five days in addition to standard of care compared to 15 patients who only received standard of care. It's not clear what exactly was in the standard of care. The primary outcome was viral load reduction in respiratory secretions at day five. They found no difference in viral load between groups. They did make an observation that patients with higher ivermectin plasma concentrations had lower viral loads, suggesting a, a possible dose response. The second study by Hashim and colleagues was conducted in Iraq. They include both inpatients and outpatients, ranging from mild to critical illness. Patients were randomized to ivermectin at a dose of 200 micrograms per kilogram for two or three days, plus doxycycline for five to 10 days, plus standard of care, versus standard of care alone. And their standard of care included all or some of the following, vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, dexamethasone, and or azithromycin. The primary outcomes included time to recovery, progression of disease, and mortality. The authors found a seven-day faster time to recovery with ivermectin plus doxycycline, and that was statistically significant. There was no difference in the rate of disease progression or mortality.
The third study by Chikar and colleagues was published in the International Journal of Sciences. They included outpatients with mild COVID-19. 25 patients received ivermectin for three doses and were compared to 25 controls. The primary outcome was response at day seven. And the authors found no difference between groups. Around 60% for both groups were asymptomatic at day seven. The next study by El Ghazar and colleagues studied inpatients and outpatients and evaluated ivermectin for both treatment and prophylaxis. They included six different groups. Each group had 100 patients. Group one included those with mild to moderate disease who received ivermectin plus standard of care. Standard of care in this study included azithromycin, vitamin C, zinc, and acetaminophen. Group two patients had mild to moderate disease and received hydroxychloroquine plus standard of care. Group three patients had severe disease and received ivermectin at 400 micrograms per kilogram for four days plus standard of care. Group four patients had severe disease and received hydroxychloroquine plus standard of care. Uh, and group five patients were actually healthcare workers or household contacts and they received ivermectin at 400 micrograms per kilogram as a single dose repeated seven days later as prophylaxis. And then group six participants were healthcare workers or household contacts who did not receive ivermectin. There were multiple primary outcomes which included lab improvements such as CRP, D-dimer, and PCR conversion, as well as hospital stay. The authors found a significant improvement in lab parameters and PCR conversion at day seven. Prognosis was improved and hospital duration was shorter in the ivermectin groups compared to the hydroxychloroquine groups. Healthcare workers and household contacts had lower conversion rates as well. So these studies had mixed findings, some showing benefit and some finding no benefit with ivermectin. To speak collectively to some of the limitations of these studies, the studies are not placebo controlled and frequently do not report details about what standard of care patients received, which is a concern, as it's difficult to know what is driving the outcomes when patients could have received different therapies and it's unclear who received what. Uh, also, these are small studies and some have a very heterogeneous population, so it's difficult to ascertain which patients are driving the outcomes. Some of the studies had multiple primary outcomes and some were incompletely defined, for example, if recovery or improvement is part of the primary outcome, the reader needs to know the definition of recovery or improvement, as well as how it's determined. This level of detail is missing from many of these studies. Most of these studies appropriately conclude that these are hypothesis generating pilot studies and any findings would need to be confirmed via larger randomized controlled trials. So these three studies are randomized placebo controlled trials. The first study by Ahmed and colleagues was out of Bangladesh. They included hospitalized patients with mild COVID-19 and randomized them to ivermectin at 12 milligrams daily for five days versus single dose ivermectin plus doxycycline for five days versus placebo. There were 24 patients in each arm. Their primary outcomes were time to viral clearance, resolution of fever and cough. They found time to viral clearance was earlier with the five day ivermectin group and this was statistically significant when compared to placebo. However, the ivermectin doxycycline arm was not significantly shorter compared to placebo. And there was no difference in resolution of fever or cough. The authors conclude that a larger randomized controlled trial of ivermectin treatment appears to be warranted to validate these findings. The second study was from Iran. They included hospitalized patients with mild to severe disease. All groups received hydroxychloroquine as Iran's standard of care. They included six different arms with 30 patients in each arm. There was a standard of care arm, a placebo plus standard of care arm, and then four ivermectin arms of varying doses and durations. The primary outcome was clinical recovery within 45 days. They found a reduced risk of death in the ivermectin arms. The 400 microgram per kilogram single dose a group had the best composite of death, hospital duration, and duration of low oxygen saturations. They concluded that ongoing studies with larger sample sizes and a focus on severe COVID-19 cases are recommended. The third study by Chikor and colleagues was from Spain, 
They studied outpatients with mild disease without risk factors for progression to severe disease. There were 12 patients who received 400 micrograms per kilogram of ivermectin as a single dose and 12 who received placebo. The primary outcome was detectable of virus by PCR at day seven. They found that almost everyone in both groups were still PCR positive at day seven, so no differences between groups. Some limitations with these studies are the small numbers of patients and most had soft primary outcomes, for example, detection of virus rather than evaluation of clinical outcomes. The Ahmed and Shakur studies found mixed results as far as impact on viral clearance. The Iran study did have a clinical primary outcome of recovery within 45 days, although they didn't actually report this finding as it was defined. Other limitations in the Iran study are that the disease severity was not well defined and all patients received hydroxychloroquine as standard of care, uh, which is not usual standard of care. These authors all acknowledge that these are pilot studies and any results need to be confirmed via a larger randomized controlled trial. The first study here is a randomized controlled trial by Beltran Gonzalez and colleagues, which evaluated hospitalized patients with evidence of COVID-19 pneumonia. Patients were randomized to one of three treatment arms hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, or placebo. There was no difference in their primary outcome of duration of hospital stay or any other outcomes, including progression to respiratory failure or death. The next study was published in JAMA on March 4th and is the largest randomized controlled trial to date. This was a study of inpatients and outpatients, although the vast majority were outpatients with mild COVID-19 pneumonia. Patients were randomized to receive five days of ivermectin or placebo. The primary outcome was time to resolution of symptoms. Authors reached sufficient power with the 398 patients included in the analysis. There was no difference in time to resolution of symptoms or in any of the secondary outcomes, including the proportion of patients who were symptom-free at 21 days. The authors did collect data on adverse reactions. 7.5% of patients in the ivermectin group and 2.5% in the placebo group discontinued treatment due to an adverse event. Serious adverse events developed in four patients, two in each group, but none were considered by the investigators to be related to the trial medication. There are currently 52 trials registered on clinicaltrials.gov when searching ivermectin and SARS-CoV-2. I won't go over the slide in detail, rather we'll point out some of the key takeaways from the 24 actively recruiting studies. Most of the data are coming from Egypt and Brazil for the treatment, as opposed to prophylaxis, of outpatients with mild to moderate disease. As for safety, ivermectin is well tolerated. Cutaneous reactions can occur in patients being treated for certain parasites. Larger doses cross the blood-brain barrier, which can lead to CNS effects. For this reason, the American Academy of Pediatrics cautions against using ivermectin in young children due to a less developed blood-brain barrier and an increased risk for CNS effects. Again, ivermectin is pretty well tolerated. Many of the adverse effects are related to the use of ivermectin for parasites specifically. When 10 times the standard dose was evaluated in that PK study we discussed previously, Headache, nausea, dizziness, and rash occurred in both the ivermectin and the placebo-treated groups. I'll leave you with some clinical pearls for ivermectin. It is generally well tolerated. Standard dose is 200 micrograms per kilogram, usually as a single dose. An effective dose for COVID-19 is unknown. In vitro, it has activity against SARS-CoV-2 with an IC50 of 2.5 micromoles. In vivo, substantially higher doses would be needed to achieve viral inhibition. There is very limited quality data for its use in COVID-19 for treatment or prevention. And lastly, the IDSA guidelines recommend against the use of ivermectin outside of a clinical trial. The NIH guidelines state there are insufficient data to recommend either for or against the use of ivermectin for the treatment of COVID-19, and both of these guidelines were last updated in February. In summary, despite the amount of interest and excitement around this agent as a therapeutic for COVID-19, there is a lack of high-quality evidence from well-designed and well-executed clinical trials 
to suggest ivermectin is a safe and effective therapy for prevention or treatment of COVID-19. Ivermectin should not be used for COVID-19 outside of a clinical trial. Thanks so much for tuning in and feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions.